So, uh, I'm Charlie Walden, and uh, most people back home, back home is Missouri, know me as the president of the Missouri Fiddlers Association and someone who for years organized contests and fiddle camps and all sorts of things like that. And I've been playing the fiddle for, I figured out the other day, 50 years. Playing the fiddle. And I'm about to figure it out, I think. Just <laughs> So this is my wife, Pat Plunkett. She's going to play the piano. And, and uh, up in Missouri, you know, I always tell people, Missouri wasn't really a banjo state like uh, the Appalachian states. It was more of a piano state as far as what play, was most commonly played with the fiddle. And pipe pianos and pump organs. Uh, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to play through some uh, Missouri and Midwestern quadrilles, uh, or six-eighters that my friend Dwight Lamb up in Iowa, they call them six-eighters. But they're the tunes that are in six-eight time that don't get a lot of play anymore. And I'm personally on a crusade to bring these tunes back because they're way fun to play. And if you're, if you're uh, uh, more of a novice player, they're actually easier to play. If you think about it for a second, a regular fiddle tune in two-four time with running sixteenth notes, there's eight notes to a measure. Well, in 6-8 time, there's only six, so you got two less notes to play every bar that goes by. <laughs> so they, they really, I use them a lot in workshop because they really are a lot easier to, to get onto. Um, so what I've got here is, a, I've, I'm going to, uh, I wrote a, an article a few years ago. It's not, I, I redid our Missouri Fiddler's work, uh, website a couple of years ago and haven't got everything put back up, but I wrote a pretty long article about 6-8 time fiddling in, in the Midwest. And I'm just going to read you that article now for the next 45 minutes. If that's okay. No, no I'll, I'll post that uh, up on my, on my blog. I've got a blog. It's called blog.charliewalden.com. And I'll also throw it up on the Masatha website, which is missourifiddling.com. But I've been fascinated by these tunes. When, when I, where I grew up in central Missouri, uh, it was a little more of a southern tradition. In fact, that area of the state is called Little Dixie. There's a lot of people there who came from Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia. Uh, my dad's folks all came from, they started in Virginia and went through on to, to Indiana for a little while and then to Missouri. So they were in that kind of Little Dixie vein of music and culture. And uh, so I didn't hear many of these tunes when I was growing up. I lived near Columbia, Missouri. Uh, one of my... Uh, Great teachers was Pete McMahon, another was a guy named Taylor McBain. But I noticed right away that everybody played one certain tune that they all knew, and we'll play a little bit of that right now here. Let's see if I can get into it. Just give me a moment. Yes, yes. G. What tune is the it? The Irish washerwoman. <laughs> you don't need to know what tune it is. <laughs> distributed piece of music, not in just North America, but I think in the world. There's hardly any place you can go. We played on, you know, four continents, and uh, and uh, everyone knows that tune. They might not know the name of it, but they've heard it. It's really a piece of fiddle music that wormed its way into popular culture, and it's and it's there to stay. So, uh, so, so that one is everywhere. So every fiddler I've ever met of the old school, they all knew that tune. They didn't know 
uh, have any context for it necessarily, but they all played it. It's in, uh, uh, if, if you know, being from Chicago, you know, that used to be a big Sears, living in Chicago, it used to be a big Sears town, you know, back in the early part in the, at the turn of the other century. Is, is this the Roaring Twenties? Can we call it that? <laughs> so in the other century, uh, there was a, you know, Sears Roebuck mailed, I, it might not be even a stretch to say millions of violins all over the Midwest, especially the upper Midwest, you know, uh, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Wisconsin, all those upper, Ohio, all those upper tier states, Sears sold their fiddles all over the place. And they always sold a little tutorial with the, every instrument included a little tutorial. I think it was called Bauer's Method for the Violin. Uh, there was one that Montgomery Ward had and one that Sears had. I may have them mixed up. But uh, there, there was a little booklet. And in that booklet, and in every other tiny little tutorial book, a buddy of mine down in Missouri kind of went on a jag collecting these. Now there's something to collect, you know. Tutorials of the, for the violin from like 1880. Uh, and they all included the Irish washerwoman. And so you got to figure that that was one of the ways that tune got disseminated so widely. But it's, it's much older than that. Uh, and it was also, uh, you know, you've heard of, uh, there's, everyone knows about black minstrelsy. Well, there was also Irish minstrelsy in, in New York in the 1800s, early to mid-1800s. And that tune doubtless would have uh, figured into those kinds of performances. So the Irish washerwoman. Unfortunately, it's not an easy tune to play. There's, if you notice, there's a lot of string crossing. So it's not one I'd recommend taking on right away. But, but, but it's a great little tune. Uh, so, so uh, if I was to make a, if any of you scientists out there, statisticians, if I was to make a frequency histogram of collected renditions of six, eight time tunes, the bin for Irish washerwoman would be this high. There'd be a smaller bin for haste to the wedding, and the rest would be at the level of noise. It would just be they're just they're just aren't they're just. In, I mean, I talk about in Anglo-American and American fiddling. There just aren't that many of these tunes around. But it happened. Uh, well, maybe I should play a little bit of that uh, haste to the wedding. Uh, what key is that? D. All right. So, so this would be like number two, but much smaller frequency would be haste to the wedding. There it is. So, so there, there was a pocket of players uh, in Michigan who played a lot of these tunes, and there was a pocket of players in northwest Missouri, what we call the Missouri Valley region, which is kind of encompasses northwest Missouri, where I was born, in a little town called Rockport up there, uh, and uh, a little bit of uh, northeastern Kansas, a little bit of uh, southwest, southeastern Nebraska, and part of western Iowa. That's what we, and on up into South Dakota a bit. That's kind of what we call the Missouri Valley region. And there was one really prominent fiddler there who a lot of people have heard of uh, called Bob Walters. Uh, the guy, guy uh, R.P. Christensen, who wrote those two great books of collected works. People call them Missouri Fiddle Collections, but I call them Midwestern Fiddle Collections. It's mostly, there's a lot of people in there who aren't Missourians, but they're all from the states bordering Missouri. So this guy, Bob Walters, and in these books, those Christensen books, are a ton of these 6-8 tunes. Uh, 
uh, up there, they called them six eighters, and sometimes they called them the, the words quadrille, but they called them quadrilles, like kind of with a K, like you'd say Quebec, you know. So, so they they played these uh, these six eight time tunes. So I'm just going to play a few more of those. Now, one thing about these tunes is some of them you can trace back to. Uh, uh, you know, everyone thinks of the Irish mostly with this kind of music. In fact, when they teach uh, the, uh, the little kids, maybe you can tell this. <laughs> <laughs> How you tell, when they teach the little kids and adults, I've seen all the In Irish Chicago. adult musicians use this too. How to tell the difference between a jig and a reel. Oh. A jig, if you could say Flanagan, 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 it's a jig. But if it's Murphy, 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 <laughs> it's a real. <laughs> Have you seen them doing this? All right, yeah, the little kids. <laughs> so if you can say Flanagan, Flanagan over the top of the tune, yeah, you can do that as I play some more of these. It's a, it's a jig or it's a six eight time tune. So uh, I just brought. I I've been writing tunes out lately. I reached a point a few years ago where I had learned so many tunes that I started to not be able to remember how to start them without finding music. So I actually started writing things out. So if you'll pardon me for having a little bit of printed music here just to refresh my memory. So, so another one of the really big tunes, and uh, let's see if I can find a little bit to read you here. I am going to read you from my article. It's uh, a... <laughs> let's see here. So uh, uh, I, I had a, went on to JAG, and now I'm on a worse JAG. For a while, I would go into libraries in little towns and look in their old newspaper microfiche, dinky towns that had old uh, defunct newspapers, and look for stuff related to fiddling. And you know, it's amazing if you go into rural areas and you find an old defunct newspaper files, you can find tons of references to fiddle contests and people playing fiddle at dances and parties and whatnot. But what often is in there is the whoever was writing the article might listen to the names of tunes that were played. And so, uh, so, so I've, I've got something here. Uh, there was a radio station in, in Jefferson City called WOS, and it was broadcast from the state capitol. Uh, there's currently a station called KWOS, which grabbed their uh, call letters after the station went defunct, but it was owned by the state of Missouri Marketing Bureau, and they did it solely for the purpose of telling farmers when the best prices were to bring their crops to market. This would have been like 1923, and I think 1922 was the first commercial radio broadcast out of Pittsburgh. So this is really early radio, and WSM was 23, I think, also. So it's really early radio. But anyway, so uh, there were some description of uh, some music being played on the station there in one of the Jefferson City newspapers, and they listed uh, the tunes, and so I know they didn't say these are six, eight tunes, but they listed the Camels Are Coming, may have heard of that. Haste to the Wedding I just played, and Pop Goes the Weasel. That used to be a very popular tune for fiddlers to play. Uh, let me just play a little bit, a little touch of Pop Goes the Weasel in G. You've never played this, but I won't, I won't, do, the, I won't do the trick under the leg bowing. Well, well, maybe I will. It's, it's a little, it might be a little, I might get tangled up, though, if I try that. There's like four large volumes he came out with in the 50s of collected uh, a lot of folk songs, a lot of tunes, uh, reminiscences. They're really great books. They're long out of print. You find them for a ridiculous price on eBay, but if you look in your library, it's called, just look up Vance Randolph. Uh, but he, he was a, a well-known folklorist in the 50s. And so he collected some other titles. 
uh, down in the Ozarks. And so he, he collected uh, something called Irish Jig, who knows what that is, the Irish Washerwoman, Life on the Ocean Waves, I'll play that next here. Uh, and then something called Happy Jack, which was in 6-8 time. And then one with a very interesting title, Wiggle Ass Jig. I have no idea. I would like to, I'd like to hear that tune. I have no idea what that's about. Uh, you can use your own imagination there to sort that out. Uh, so I was going to play a little Life on the Ocean Waves. This, uh, uh, again, when you hear this, it's probably something you've heard but never knew the title of because it's probably been in a lot of cartoons, you know, Tex Avery style cartoons, you know. Uh, let's see. G. Come on, brain. Here we go. Okay. Intro. I'm doing it the old-fashioned way, you know, like they would have done way back in the 1800s with a Bluetooth speaker. And let's see if I can see if I can make get this thing connected here. If you if you have your Bluetooth on and you suddenly are connected to my speaker, just let, just let me know. <laughs> there is that date. There is that hazard nowadays, you know. Suddenly, I'm hearing your phone conversation from out in the parking lot. Let's see if I can make this thing work here. If any of you use a fitness watch, is anybody else worth it? Yes. You, you know, if you put it on your right arm while you're playing, you get extra yes. steps. <laughs> Three steps. If you stop your foot as well, it's really good. Okay, put it on your ankle. Uh, just, just above that bracelet the court's making you wear. <laughs> Let's hear uh, a version of the Irish Washerwoman, kind of old school, uh, central Missouri rendition of the Irish Washerwoman. I think this is Pete McMahon. These files aren't labeled very well here. Here we go. And whose fault is that? That's my, that would be my fault. So that, I remember what that recording is now, that's a, a guy that's in Columbia, Missouri at the Older Americans Club in 1975. Uh, that was Taylor McBain playing and there was a guy in the background you could hardly hear playing tenor banjo, a guy named Thad Hurt. But Taylor's one of the guys I learned from. So I drug that cassette tape around that said, Fiddling 1975 on it. That's all it said on the tape. I had to recall when I finally found it and went through, digitized all my old tapes like 10 years ago. And it still played, that's what I couldn't believe. It was on the cheapest possible Radio Shack tape you could buy back in those days. But, but it still played. All right, let's, uh, let's hear a little Over the Ocean Waves. I think this is uh, Dwight Lamb, the one I played a minute ago, the one. That one, okay. Here we go.
that for a second. Actually, that's Cyril Stennis, a buddy of mine. Chris Germain recorded him uh, in the early 80s up at his house in uh, Oregon, Missouri. But So this, uh, listen this time, I'm going to start it again and listen to the guitar. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about accompaniment for these 6-8 tunes because it's kind of challenging, it really is. Just listen, listen to what's going on here first. So that gives you an idea. Now he kind of changed the melody around a bit, didn't he? So, so he he probably learned that not from a page he didn't read. So he, he learned it from hearing it somewhere and then put his own remembered it best he can and, and made it work out. So what I was saying about the accompaniment though is you know six eight time there's two beats per bar. Bump. Okay, so that's not a very good example. That tune. Let me find it in my brain. That's a fine example. It works. I know, but it's not. It doesn't have the three beats per beat. Three. Well, it does because he was playing at half time. I understand. Okay. That's not the point. I'm, that's not the point I'm trying to make. Well, here. I have no idea what you're making. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so so anyway, if I if I go back to Irish washerwoman, so there's three beats. Every time there's three eighth notes, there's a beat. So, so the best way, or the way most people accompany these tunes, is as Pat does. It's long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. Kind of bump, ba bump, ba bump. Let's play a little Irish washerwoman, and, and it works so well on the piano. Uh, it's very it's soothing. It's easy on the piano. Try it right real time. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, but I could switch to what he was doing. While but I don't need you to. Fine, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go. See? So it's long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. Okay, so so but that's kind of that's hard to do on the guitar if you think about it because it's not you're used to doing a kind of an even thing. Boom, 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 boom. You know, boom, chuck, boom. But you're going boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom. So you have to hit that the chuck part really short and get back to the bass note. And with a flat pick, on it's, the next chord. it's really hard to do. I, I I can do it, but I've done it. I've been doing it a lot of years, but if you just sit down and try to play with a jig, you go, what in the world? And so what we had here was this guy said, he treated it as if it was at half time. So he was playing boom, chuck, boom. Oh, not even that. He was just, you, you do it. You do it, Pat. Okay. I'll play it. I'll play it regular and then I'll switch. Switch to that. So that's, so that's what we heard there, but that doesn't really uh, do justice to what you want to feel with a jig, you know? That's, that's, not the, that's not the quadrille or jig feel. And, and I've heard other people kind of just, uh, and a lot of the, if you listen to a lot of modern, modern Irish bands where people are playing dad gad style guitar, you know, you know what I mean by that? The, the uh, D A D, uh, what's this? It's, it's got a low D. That's all I need to know. <laughs> and so, so, but anyway, I call it the jinga jinga approach because basically just have, have the pick and they're kind of going jinga 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 jinga, almost like a like a. Uh, doing it on every beat. It's, like it's like a shuffle. It's like a old. Yeah. It's like folk, folky guitar from the '60s, you know, where you're playing over the sound hole. The string you want the strings in the floppiest possible way, and you're just kind of 
doing what you can to keep it going, you know. Uh, but I really like the long short, long short, long short because that gives you the feel of the jig. So uh, this is an anecdote I got from R.P. Christensen was, uh, that's the guy who wrote that book, uh, Missouri Tune book. Uh, he heard uh, a fiddler playing called uh, Bill Caton, who was a fiddler, a, a black fiddler there in central Missouri, and his accompanist was a guy named, with a great name, Ola Gathright. I love that name. That's an old-timey name, if there was one. So Ola Gathright played a big guitar, and, and Bob told me that he described Ola playing as with a clawfoot style. In other words, he would have a big thumb pick, and he would pick and pull, pick, pull, pick. So that, well, if that, with that, it's easy to get that rhythm. Pat was like, boom, chaboom, 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 you know? It's not like you're, you're not playing, fighting to get the pick back in place to play the bass note. So it was just like a, like a, you know, using these three fingers like a claw and to get, the, to get an upstroke on the chord and still have the bass being played with your thumb. So that's another way to approach uh, this. But if you, if, if you really want to have fun, learn a couple of these tunes and just take, trot them out at jam sessions and watch all the guitar players <laughs> try to figure out what the heck is going on. You know? <laughs> and, Right. Uh, or, or it could have been a down, but just right. He was just playing one. He, he was treating it like it was in half time, basically. He was playing the downbeat on beat two of the bar is what he was doing. Well, I think she was talking about the thing you were just saying, though. The, yeah. thing, the thing I was just talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the clawfoot thing. Yeah. Oh, no, it was, it was pull up. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it was like almost finger pick. I mean, it was like finger picking, yeah, except you just keep, keep these three together and pull up on the chord and hit down with the, with the thumb to play the bass, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't a down strum, right? That, that would be a different, and that'd be another way to do it, though. Actually, too, you could do a down strum as well, right? If you're holding a pick. It's pretty hard. Well, no, if you have a thumb pick, right. though, thumb, thumb pick. pick, you can you can do it. So, okay, so it's, I just wanted to mention a little bit about the accompaniment. So let's uh, let's listen to a couple more recorded examples here. Uh, another really great tune I'll play after we listen to this is uh, uh, these tunes. We're not sure where a lot of them came from. Uh, uh, they're not Irish. They're not really Scottish. You don't find them in other tune collections. There's some bleed over. I'll show you some of the bleed over ones here in a second. But these are American tunes, we surmise, that probably came out of tune collections from the 1800s. There was one tune collection that was referenced often by Christensen per Bob Walters reference. And Bob Walters could read music. Uh, something called E.T. Roots Gems of the Ballroom was a, 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 a set of collection of, of books of dance tunes that were printed in the 1880s. And I think he learned a lot of tunes out of those books. And I, su I suspect that some of these came from a source like that or tune books of that era. But then there was also uh, something going on in, the, in the, that area of uh, the Missouri Valley and also other parts of the upper Midwest there were people of Scandinavian descent. Uh, and in the Missouri Valley, Dwight Lamb's family were all Danish. And one time we went, uh, have you heard of a guy named Christian Bugga? Christian Bugga? He's a great Danish fiddler, young guy. He's been over, he's probably in his late 30s. He's been over here many times, but he's taken Dwight Lamb to Denmark several times because he's he found out that Dwight was the holder of tunes that it, they were no longer playing in Denmark that his grandfather brought over. But so where I'm going with that is a lot of those Danish tunes, the polkas and some Scandinavian, other Scandinavian music is in 6-8 time. And so the tunes got adapted around a little bit. Maybe they're not played in exactly the same form uh, rhythmically, but they're still in 6-8 time and they made them sound like jigs when they got over here because kind of people knew that form. And when Anglo players got a hold of them, they switched them around. So here's a quadrille that Dwight Lamb is playing on a single row Honer uh, accordion, it's button accordion, and it's a tune I'd heard up there many times in that neck of the woods. But here it is on the accordion, and but and Dwight says this is a Danish tune, but there were guys around playing it just as a fiddle tune.
to the guitar. Now this guy's playing the guitar. Boom, cha boom, cha boom, cha boom. Like he's playing like that. Let's dig down and play uh, a couple, a few more of these kind of uh, really obscure Midwestern quadrilles. Uh, here's one that we call number 189 in the first Christus of Book because it doesn't have a title. So. Took me years to figure out that. A. Come on, brain. Don't fail me now. You know that one. By the way, you know, I really take Pat for granted a lot because no matter what goofy tune I start to play, somehow she finds something that works with it. So. <laughs> and we know some goofy ones, don't we? Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, here's number 189. Again, this is Bob Walters. Nope, Cyril. It's going to be Cyril.
All right. That's that's now. I don't know if you know who Cyril Stennett is, but he was a left-handed player, right? Then he played a right-handed player's fiddle over the bass like this. And so when he's reaching up to go, he's like, you know, I don't see how he played up the neck really with great facility, and I don't see how he did it because you know, that's a, and that's. A, a lot of a lot of those tunes have stuff up on the E, but he never shifted. He would just kind of like go for it. Start to go. You know, you might be inclined to go, but he'd go. So that was the Oyster River quadrille. Uh, so now let's move over and uh, play some. Uh, Tunes, quick six eight time tunes that because these guys already had a propensity to like this music, they started hearing other things as we get into the 50s and 60s and more music becomes available. And also, uh, I heard anecdotes from several people, Dwight Lamb for one, but others as well, that they could hear those wonderful CBC broadcasts on a late cold night. You know, AM radio, there's something called the ionospheric effect, I believe it's called, where AM radio, back in the day, when, the, when we had clear channel, when there weren't, weren't other stations all over the country using a particular frequency, once the sun went down, it would go thousands of miles. Like, there were, the WS radio people had, had there were things in, in there that they said people heard their broadcast in Hawaii. I mean, like... Because there just weren't that many ch channels, there was no cluttering of the frequencies. And so these guys in northern Missouri and western Iowa could hear Don Messer on playing out of Prince Edward Island, Canada on the CBC. And those tunes kind of fit the way they played, the way they thought music went. And so they started learning all these great tunes from Canada. Uh, and another source of those tunes, and the one I'm about to play I think falls into that category, uh, Dwight, Dwight told me a great a little anecdote once about him and his grandfather and his father. It was a, some morning they were supposed to be farming and it was pouring rain. So what does a farmer do on a day when it's pouring rain? They go to a bar at 6 a.m. and have a beer. And so they were in this bar having a beer at 6 o'clock in the morning and in comes the jukebox guy to, to you know get the money out of the jukebox. And they, I guess uh, Dwight's dad wandered over and said, Hey, do you think you can get some fiddle music in this jukebox? The guy said, well, yeah, I sure can. So next time I'm in, I'll bring some with me. So he brought all these Ned Landry records. Ned Landry was a great fiddler from up in New Brunswick and whatever else he had. But they were all these Canadian fiddle records because Canada had a real boom going on of producing fiddle records in those days. And so I'm sure they were probably easy to get from whatever job or sold in his records, you know. So they started going in and plugging nickels into that jukebox and learning Woodchopper's Breakdown and Angus Campbell and all these tunes that we associate with that region, but they all came in and via this jukebox, apparently. Wow. But one of those tunes uh, was something called The Little Burnt Potato, which is a very popular tune in Canada and especially in the Maritime Provinces. I'm not sure who wrote it, but the, a guy who played it a lot was Ned Landry. And so we'll play a little bit of the Little Burnt Potato, indeed.
were these tunes used for uh, other than just listening there in the, in the, in the, the Missouri Valley and other parts of the Midwest? Well, it, surprisingly, they make really good square dance tunes. Uh, you can square dance to them very, very easily. Uh, so, and we actually did, a, we had heard uh, people talk about this, uh, R.P. Christensen and others, and so whenever some of us, the, the young whippersnappers, would go to some dance out in the country and maybe get asked to play, we'd play a six-eight time tune just to see what would happen. And people just didn't even miss a beat, you know. They just, oh yeah, let's dance. You know, they knew exactly what to do. So it was, it was apparent that they'd heard that before, but it just, again, it's something that just fell out of vogue. Uh, those tunes had been, had been quite popular. So let's see. Let's play. Let's play a couple more, and then I'll take I'll take some questions here. Well, I can take questions anywhere along the line if you have any. But uh, uh, so let, let's see. Let's try another one uh, that also is a uh, I would say a book tune, but very popular up in that area called uh, the Irishman's Heart to the Ladies. Let's try a little bit of that. A uh huh. Yep. And th this is one that Cyril played, and Bob and Bob Walters would have played. Francis O'Neill. Okay, O'Neill's Music of Ireland. Okay, We live up in Chicago now, and I always tell people you can't walk down State Street swinging a dead cat without any Irish musician in the head. I mean, they're just like, they're everywhere. Sorry about the cat lovers, the, the dead cat image. But you get what I'm saying. There's a lot of them. I was going to say you can't walk down the street without tripping over one, but that would imply they drink to excess. I didn't want to say that. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, where was I going with that? Oh, Captain Francis O'Neill. Yes, Captain Francis O'Neill. So apparently, Captain Francis O'Neill, if you read his book, which is a really nice read, called Irish Music, A Fascinating Hobby, this is a book he wrote. And it's not a tune book. He, he compiled this massive book of 1,800 tunes, collected mostly by, from, mus from transplanted Irish musicians living in Chicago. He was, he was sorry about that. Oh, so, yes, yeah, somebody sent me a message here. Turn, turn, turn this off. I'll turn this off. So, but he transcribed all this music from all these expat Irish people living living in Chicago. And uh, in fact, in those days, that was a requirement for getting on the force. You had to be Irish, and you had to play play an instrument or, or be able to transcribe music. Either of those would work, get you a job on the police force. But uh, so, but for a time, he describes in his book living in Missouri as a, and being a school teacher in a rural town in Missouri. Uh, this town's called Edina, Missouri, which is way in the windswept plain north part, part of North Missouri. It's the dinkiest, most impossible to find little place 
it's no bigger now than it was then, probably, and it's, you know, has like 20 people in it, but it's a tiny place. How this guy, this Irish immigrant, ended up teaching school there, no one will ever know, but he gives a really nice, just in a single paragraph, gives a really nice description of the people who came into this, uh, into this place. Let's see, if, I don't ha think I have it all here. No, I just mentioned that he, 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 he heard them playing Irish 6-8 uh, time music. So that's his reference. So that would have been in the 1800s, late 1800s sometimes. So it's again another little bit of evidence that we have that the music was much, once more popular than it, than it is now. And so I was going to play one more piece here. Uh, I'll play one called Art Wooten's Quadrille which is in B-flat, and uh, those guys in, in Northwest Missouri and the Missouri Valley really love playing in the flat keys. Don't know why, but they, they, they really, the tunes, they do a lot of tunes in those flat keys. So this is a very nice little piece, Art Wooten's Quadrille, and then I'll take a few questions. And <laughs> but th thanks so much, I just want to say thanks to uh, Todd and Mary Alice and anyone else who was instrumental in getting us here. We've wanted to come for a long time. And, we're really enjoying ourselves. Wow, the cabins are great, the facilities are great. We're just thanks so much. So here's a little Art Wooten's quadrille. Chicago, not the Missouri tunes. So, yeah, those those are those are tunes he collected from expat uh, Irish people when he. Would... Oh yes, well it, that's because they're just really common, yeah, really common tunes. Like, like Irishman's Heart to the Ladies, I bet is is in there. Yeah, yes. Yes, there were shoddishes. I don't think I've ever run any, in, into anybody playing mazurkas. They may have up in Wisconsin, for instance, you know, uh, further north. But they definitely played shoddishes, yeah. Does everybody know what a shoddish is? You know, yeah. So it's another type of tune. Yeah, there definitely were shoddishes. Not too many. Probably uh, half a dozen I maybe could have collected back in those days. There's a few of those in the RP. Yeah, in the Christensen book there's some shoddishes. That's right. No mazurkas. Though. <laughs> yes? I have a two-part question. Um, I'm curious of the origins of the word quadrilles as it came over from, say, Ireland or South mm -hmm. America and then to America. They chose to use the word quadrilles with all these, and then, like, some of those, like, Irish's heart would be classified as maybe a jig yes. or a slide. And I'm curious, like, the rhythmic or phrasing distinctions, quadrille, slide, or just regular jig that has that long, short, long, short. Like, mm -hmm. those type of jigs sometimes they call a slide. I'm just wondering um, the origins of quadrille 
and the distinctions of it's much different than horn pipe, which more dotted. Sure. That, so I'm just curious that distinction of those three, or is it just quadrilles is a general hockey dance tune that they use that term? Or is it Okay, so, so the question is, uh, if you could hear, it was just like, you want to distinguish between these terms, uh, the quadrille, the jig, and also mentioned the slide, yeah. Now I think a slide is a 3-8, actually. These are all triple meter time, triple meter tunes, though. Go ahead. A slide is really much faster than a jig. A lot of people would say, Rogue to Liz Dumarna, in the Irish, I mean, the Irish. That's a slide. They would say, that's a slide, not a jig. A lot of people would play it with, like, Swaltel jig, or Irishman's heart, they would call that a... A jig, but it's hard to distinguish a slide from a jig in their categories in the iron. If you play for dancers, you have to play a slide really, really fast. And, and sets, you know, their square sets call for you play a, a, a reel, you play a jig, but a slide's going to be a lot faster. So it has less notes from me just playing in Kaylee bands. And I just take a deep breath before a slide and yeah. hope I can hang on. May I be I, th I think I could show you some examples when, when we're done here, too. Yeah, just the, the origin of the quadrille. Right. So the quadrille, the term quadrille is French, actually, and that's, it, it just was mean four, right? So actually that's kind of the quadrille dance is sort of where we get the square dance from, that French tradition. But quadrilles themselves, if you go up into Canada, are multiple part dances, okay? And so there might be there might be five parts to a quadrille, and they might be in different key signatures. So you might the time signatures rather, sorry. So you might have a, a two four portion, a four four portion, a six eight portion. So I think that term just kind of leaked over, uh, and all those guys in North Missouri and, and in the Missouri Valley area, if, if, it had, if it was in six eight time, they called it a quadrille. Okay. Irishman's heart to the lady was they to them that's a quadrille, but. Yeah, you know, and then you can get into the whole thing with in Irish music. There's double jigs, single jigs, you know, and what, uh, you know, like like a, a single jig would be have predominant would predominantly be da 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 like. I think they call that a single jig, and a, and a, a double jig is the one that goes, which fills in all the spaces with eighth notes. I believe this is the distinction there. <laughs> Uh, yes? Uh, yes, you know, when, when I'm at Clifftop, we like to go to Clifftop. Pat's been 29 times, and I've been... No, I don't know. I've tw missed twice. She's missed twice, you know, and I've been you know, 20 sometimes. And you know, there are a lot of banjo players at Clifftop. And sometimes in your campsite, you might look up, you're playing a tune, and there's seven people playing the banjo. And, and, you, and, you have, and you have a need to have a need to have fewer banjos. So if you usually if you play a jig, you'll immediately have fewer banjos. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> but no, no, I've, I've heard people, uh, you guys know Cameron DeWitt? He does this podcast. Really talented guy. He can play with anything. There's people who've worked out a claw hammer lick for 6'8", for sure. Now I haven't heard much recorded, and I know some good good players in West Virginia who I sit and play with, and I, they they'll sit and play these tunes with me, because some of the old guys they learned from played those tunes, you know. But that wasn't really a very direct answer to them. <laughs> yes. You had not mentioned any relationship between military music and the six eighters, and you hadn't mentioned any relationship between religious music and the six eighters. Okay, well, there definitely would be a relationship with military music because uh, a lot of those, these tunes, uh, I haven't found them in books, so that's the problem I have with, with jumping. There's definitely got to be a relationship because a lot of the music that's played in the upper Midwest is from a very nice book called Ryan's Mammoth Collection of Fiddle Music, or later we call, I call Cole's 1,000 Fiddle Tunes. And there's a ton of martial music in, in that book. And there's a bunch of those that are, uh, would have been used for military purpose, like Gary Owen and some of those kinds of tunes. So the, definitely there's a connection, but with, the, with what I collected, I don't, I didn't see it directly, but there's no doubt that, and, and the fact that, you know, there were, there were all these brass bands all over the rural Midwest, uh, 
during the 1880s and after, you know, especially after the Civil War, that brass bands were very popular. They were all playing music in 6-8 time. It definitely had an influence, but I, I can't draw any lines, I guess. I don't, I, I, about religious music, I don't have any knowledge there of that either, sorry. Yes? How does the overall corpus of six acres in the Missouri Valley compare to that of the area in Michigan that you referenced? Oh, okay. And uh, is, is the, you know, is it a lot of overlap or different tunes? And is the area of Michigan as well documented as, as uh, 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 Missouri? Um, yes, there's, uh, I'll start with the one back half there. There are people who've documented that the Michigan tradition. They, they weren't maybe drilling down for 6-8 tunes particularly, but a lot of 6-8 tunes recorded. Uh, more modern player like Les Raber, who you know passed away a, a bit ago, he knew a lot of 6-8 time tunes. Uh, Pat and I have been going up to Canada and playing a lot in the last few years though, and I'm finding that a lot of the Michigan repertoire is Ontario based kind of tunes, you know, that leaked over because it's right there, you know. Uh, but there are definitely, especially in that hammer dulcimer tradition in, in uh, central Michigan, there's a lot of 6-8 time stuff they played too, so there's some, there's some uh, connection there as well. Yes? A lot of the you know, Celtic gigs that are, are minor or modal sounding, mm -hmm. pretty much everything you've played has been happy major sounding. Are there many, are there, are there minor and modal uh, that, actually, that was, let's say much time I have here. Yeah, yeah. There's actually I can play you one example. Actually, I, I have one example on here. Uh, there, there's not. This is the only one I know of. It's called. It's a tune called. Oh, okay. I got five minutes here. It's a tune called the Prodigal Son that Walters played. Let's see if I can get connected here and play. Yeah, oh, there we go. That was handy. Okay. So let's. Let me, so he asked me if there's. You know, a lot of the Irish music is very minor, and and. Uh, um, and even the Irish can make a jig sound sad. Yeah, they can make a jig sound sad. I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so this one was called The Prodigal Son that Walters played. It's really an outlier. I've ne and I've listened to a lot of Celtic music and never found anything that correlates with it. But it's a really great tune, but it's very, very much like you describe an Irish kind of minor sounding thing. So that's Bob Walters, and actually, that, that's a the, the that tune is such a massive outlier because he's actually doing bowed triplets too in there, like you, like an Irish player would do. It's very unusual. That's the Prodigal Son. Now, where now I know you're all clamoring to get more of this music. I know <laughs> everyone gets so excited about playing in six eight time. So uh, the Missouri Fiddlers Association has a Bandcamp page. Are you familiar with Bandcamp? It's a download site. So, and we've got about like 40 albums of Midwestern Missouri music up there. But a few years ago, I took, I went through all my recorded field recordings and some other commercial record, or like uh, uh, self-made discs that Fiddlers had made and pulled off and compiled all these Midwestern 6-8 tunes. And I've got 90 tunes up there you can download in three, uh, divided up as three albums. They're just called Mid Midwestern Quadrilles and 6 Eighters, I think it is. Or, and you can just stream them and listen to them for free, too, but they cost a dime a piece. <laughs> if you want them for your very own. But I, I, I think I'm about done here. So I, I'm going to...